How do you decide what wines to bring to a podcast that's going to be less than 30 minutes long when you have 57 different wines under your umbrella? Rainey's partner Marie combined their love of science and the outdoors and took it down the Victorian coast with a new focus in viticulture. In this episode of Got Some, Ray shares how they discovered the site, created such a diverse wine portfolio and how they're still on the hunt to make more. I think that in every Pinot Noir maker, there's always a Nebbiolo maker trying to get out because I think as difficult as Pinot is to make, Nebbiolo is 10 times more difficult. Stick around to find out why this world famous chef added their Chardonnay to his restaurant's wine list. Well, I think, well, Hessen, actually, the Allegra was one of his favourite Chardonnays. I actually had the strangest thing happen one time when a woman ordered three cases of Allegra. That's $1,000 a case. And I said, are you seriously, you want that? And she said, yeah, because I saw Hessen holding it and saying it was her favourite Chardonnay or something. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Got Some, a wine podcast started. We're in our third year, mate. Yeah. Power to us as we started off trying to find the best bottle of wine under $30 and now we are chatting with some of the world's best and certainly Australia's best winemakers and today being no different. Ray from Lethbridge is here and you've decided, well, we thought four, but you couldn't help yourself and you've brought six along. Welcome to the podcast. I think I might have brought seven. Okay, yeah, that's true. And I will also thank you for the beautiful sparkling that we did start with as well. Nothing like a guest bringing in a little bit of a celebratory um, bubble to uh, kick us off. So thanks for that. Well, no, it's no drama at all. It's very hard to kind of encapsulate the whole Lethbridge story in just a handful of wine. Thanks for making the journey. And Carlos, good to see you, brother. Likewise. 1996, Ray, uh, yourself and your wife, uh, your partner, um, took over the Lethbridge estate, as we now know it as Lethbridge. So we really didn't take it over. We actually created it from scratch. Right. So it didn't exist. Marie and I... um, met while we were doing our PhDs in science. And um, we decided that as part of uh, having a full and fulfilling life, we would do something which was more creative outside. And vineyards and wineries were sort of something that we were vaguely interested in, didn't know that much, but we knew that we liked wine. And uh, we thought that maybe it would be a great place to sort of coalesce the two things we love, which is science Uh, the sense of creativity, Uh, but also we're outdoor people. Making wine, growing fruit uh, was really the key to it. The things that we could control were things like where would we find the right soil, atmosphere, uh, conditions, blah, 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 that were interesting. So we started looking at what made great wines and what we recognized very early on was that that they always were grown on marginal soils you know whether that was in bordeaux or where it's gravel or it's in burgundy where it's limestone or whether it's in 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 chateau neuf uh, where it's those pudding rocks there's always a rock component and infertility of the soil i think heavy yielding vines never produce the pinnacle of great wine, I would suggest. Would you agree? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, 100%. And the other thing, and this is quite controversial, um, but I believe the marginality of climate is really important too. If you think about all the great sites of the world, Bordeaux making Cabernet is picked in autumn and late. And so some years you'll have... Hey, there's this pressure. Correct. And some years you'll have... uh, it maybe a bit lean. Some years it may be uh, difficult to make that wine. Same in Burgundy. You don't have great vintages every year. There's always on the margin. Look in the Rhone. In the northern part of the Rhone, some years are more skinny than other years for Shiraz. But here is the thing. All of these grapes ripen in autumn. So that's one of the things I started to think about. Even if you look at Sicily, hot as hell, you grow a grape variety which ripens in autumn. So Nero Muscalese will ripen in autumn. Nero de Abla will ripen in autumn. Everything in the whole of Europe ripens in autumn. Piemonte. Uh, Piemonte Marolos, in autumn. Rio, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Riesling, yeah. ultra cool climate yeah. in Germany, but... It goes further, further and correct. further, yeah. But it's still autumn. So we mm. ended up in Geelong because the soils are super varied the climate means that at this point in time, while many of my friends are picking fruit, I'm pretty sure it's still summer, even though it doesn't feel like it, uh, I'm, I'm just seeing beraison. So the first sign of the color change on the berry. So I'm not picking for six weeks. I think it'll be autumn by then. Mm. Mm. Nice. A little, little bit of a history into Morrible as an area. Yeah. 
we started from the beginning, this is now 28 years, we started from the beginning to grow things organically and biodynamically because we thought that conventional farming was more like hydroponics. If you think about, you go down to the supermarket hey, and you grab a tomato and, and it's been hydroponically grown, what does it taste like? Absolutely nothing. But you go and grab one out of your garden that's been sun-riped, it, it ripened, it tastes like a tomato. Now, if that's true for a tomato, how much more does it mean it's necessary for wine where we're all about the flavor? So I've decided to show you some of the sort of jewels in the crown. Um, so we're going to show you the first wine here is the 2018 Allegra. Now, Allegra is uh, a um, it's the name of my second daughter, but it's also our top cuvee of Chardonnay. We make five different Chardonnay cuvees, all uh, all about sight. Now, this is our top sight. This is on pure um, gravel quartz gravel soils. It's at Mountainide. This site was actually originally planted in the 1840s. So let's have a taste, shall we? Mm -hmm. Is this the current release? So you hold it on oak for a period of time before release? We, so the making of it's really, really simple. We whole bunch press, we run it straight into barrels, into 100% new barrels, and we ferment it for, takes about I don't know, six weeks, something like this. It's a slow ferment because it's an indigenous ferment. Uh, we allow it to run through 100% through malolactic, uh, and then we leave it in barrel for 15 months. And then we draw it out of barrel. It's unfiltered and unfined. And then we just basically put it into a bottle, mm. and this is what you get. But we have to rest it. Because if you think about great wines, they actually have this ability to age and that's why i think that's one of the things i like to talk about lethbridge has these long story arcs it has long and patient sort of way of making wine mm. so will you will you be keeping more and more stock behind more and more uh, wines behind to some release to release yeah, some well, museum wines and well, what we find is i mean most of our wine is sold into restaurants and i suppose restaurants are really you know, looking to have Australian producers have older vintages to show because, you see, there are, if you have great sites, you can age them. I mean, I, it was Allegra's 21st birthday last year and when we tasted one of her birth year wines, it's still fresh and vibrant. Mm. That luxury you might be able to get in auction sites for European wines, it's not so easy for Australian wines. Mm. Yeah, because this wine is still is still has so much acidity, but you feel the richness at the same time, mm. so fully mellow. Yes, you can feel that, but it's still so fresh and so, so vibrant, so energetic, right? Ray, this is the way that you want to talk about Lethbridge, but you did say we do have a 2007 here. Do you want to do a side by side now and well, talk let's, about let's that? Let's do it. Yeah, because I'll, I'll be really interested to see how the seven looks at the moment. This is um, this is one of my favourite vintages. Oh boy, it's very which different one, on the nose. What was the vintage on? Eighteen is so we're looking at something that's you know eleven years older. For me, eighteen and seven were quite similar vintages, slightly on the warmer side for Geelong, but you can still see the natural acidity of these wines are crazy, you know, and they have such a large amount of malolactic. If I didn't allow it to go through malolactic, it would taste like battery acid. Mm. But can you see the freshness of the 07 yeah. still? I mean, it's mental, eh? Well, I'm very keen to hear what the Master Sommelier has to say. About the 07? Well, um, about yeah, them as a, I as think, a I think, pair, I think. Yeah, the, the 18 it still feels like it's, I think they still oak, prevalent there's so much of that battery creamy i think this is so sharp it's beautiful wine to drink now but it certainly has a lot of potential right for aging i think the 07 the 07 that battery it's kind of faded there's not that much it, it just seems way more integrated and balanced and just on the nose straight away like everything just seems so much more subtle and a touch more white mushroom and more more tertiary i think as well yeah, for me, I think that, you know, of course, you have to wait a long time to get to that point. But the thing is, I think the, you know, um, there are restaurants around the traps that are pouring the 10 because we did a museum release of that um, just recently. I think Ren's pouring the 10, I think so is Bray. Mm. In Melbourne restaurants? Possibly, yeah. possibly. I, um, I, I left two months ago, but yeah, we, we've always did something. There you go. Vibrant, fresh, uh, kind of... 
I always like the word nervous. I always like to make nervous wines. You know, wines that are sort of, you can't, they're not meant to be easy to settle into. They should be intellectual. Yeah, 07, 07 is so long as well. So much length. Um, Pinot Noir for the next. Yeah, so I suppose the thing that you think about for Geelong straight up and what brought us to Geelong as a, as a first point is the fact that uh, great Pinot Noir and great uh, Chardonnay and cool climate styles of Shiraz are, are made in this region. So Pinot Noir, it's the largest part of our, our plantings. We plant um, yeah, quite a lot of Pinot Noir all over the whole of the Geelong region. But this is from our original vineyard that I planted. Um, so this was planted in 1996. Um, it is um, an incredibly beautiful soil. It's um, basalt-derived clay on top of basalt on top of limestone. Very interesting um, soil. The yields on this, remembering that Grand Cru is around that 35 hectolitre mark, uh, it's around about 7 to 10, so easily half. So that allows us to use big technique, you know, like I was sort of mentioned to you about carving and, and sculpting. This is like working with a big piece of flawless stone. I can do big technique. So it's 100% of this is uh, done a um, whole bunch, only with pigeage. So just by gentle foot stomping, no pump over. And it's done only at the beginning. After that, the 20 to 28 days of fermentation and wooden fermenters is we just plunge it with our hands so the extraction is like really very gentle the thing about it in the mainland australia there's a little bit of a thing everyone thinks geelong is hot but i, I look where how i'm dressed i left at 16 degrees this morning okay and that was 16 degrees and that's a summer day okay and we will get we're much more continental we have winds that come off the antarctic we're cooler than every other region except for Macedon. So my friend Michael will pick five days after me or five days a week and out towards Henty, but not all of Henty, but Henty where the reason comes from, that will pick later than I do. But on in Tasmania, all of Tasmania is warmer except for the Huon Valley. I do not know where this conception that Geelong is hot comes from. I would suggest is when you look at the wine and you look at this, there's a power to these wines. But the thing is, I don't think they're fruity. They're powerful. They're structured because of the lower yields. Have a taste. There's always a sense of ripeness um, in these wines, though, like I think that's, I agree. Yeah, like Geelong, I think is characteristically, you know, with the Bannock Burns or the Bifars, there's this ripeness, more mature fruits, more because we're waiting longer. Longer. Because yeah. the thing is, if you look at slower ripening, slower ripening. You see, the thing is, when we can use whole bunch here, because you can taste this, it's hundred percent whole bunch. It doesn't taste stemmy, because the stems are lignified and ripe. The tannin, and I use bunches to create the savouriness but still having incredible acidity. And when I tell you it's 100% new oak for 15 months, where is it? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. It's completely diluted, if I may say, with, uh, eaten. with the fruit it's hidden. Completely yet. Eaten. eaten. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I also wanted to make cool climate Shiraz, and we are on that sort of absolute limit for that. So have a taste mm. of this. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this is called Indra, named after the daughter that you've met. It's 2018, so that was the same. The previous wine was the 19 Mieta, um, so that's our top cuvee. And this is the 18 Indra, which is our top cuvee. <laughs> three, three daughters. Three daughters and a son. Three daughters and a son, yeah. Um, so the Shiraz, yeah, so it's obviously a colder climate um, style. It's uh, It does feel like it has that sort of Syrah element to it of a little bit of tapenade. Um, Absolutely. But what's interesting about this is that both of these are on my home side, so very, very cool. Um, we have this ability to ripen late and high acidity, but you can see that um, the Swiss actually found this site in the 1870s, and I rediscovered it. So that's kind of an interesting thing as well. So, and in terms of, I mean, to make a more Northern Rhone style versus a Barossa style, obviously ripeness is one thing. 
right? But what else do you think really makes you? I think acidity, natural acidity, and then tannin. When we think about Barossa wines, I think you mainly talk about fruit and and sort of a richness to it. Jam, yeah, yeah, big, powerful fruit flavors. While you look at this one, you're very hard pressed to find fruit. You're more talking about, as Angus was saying, olive tapenade and and savoury things, inkiness and these sort of things. Good. Love it. Awesome. Interesting. I always love seeing uh, different styles of Shiraz. You know, I was in Adelaide for a long time. That's where I kind of developed my love of wine and, you know, some of these expressions that I've been lucky enough to try, um, including try. yours, are very different. First to what one I was we used had to. together was a Clonakilla. We did. Shiraz. We did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that one of the lovely things we're blessed in Australia to have this sort of ability to grow fruit in so many places and make really interesting um, versions of them. So, I mean, like, I'm not saying that these are going to be for everyone. Absolutely not. Uh, but I don't make a lot of these wines, so mm -hmm. I can't. So. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, you make 1,000 bottles, 2,000 bottles, 3,000 bottles of each of the wines. I mean, having 57 wines, you got to store them and you got to separate them and pack yeah. them and it's pretty... Uh... Well, the other thing about it is that we, we export to, you know, more than 16 countries in the world and everyone gets a little slot, you know. So um, that's where, we, actually, I think your first time you tasted our wines was in the UK. Dinner by Heston Blumenthal, yeah, in yeah. London, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that was kind of it. Was kind of cool. We had actually. a good allocation of it, I think. Well, I think well, Heston actually the Allegra was one of his favourite Chardonnays. There was I actually had the strangest thing happen one time when a woman like ordered three cases of Allegra. That's thousand dollars a case, and I said, "Are you seriously you want that?" And she said, "Yeah," because I saw Heston holding it and saying it was her favourite Chardonnay or something. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Well, yeah. When Heston would come in, he would um, so, he would have um, between Bindi. And Sled Bridge, yeah, it was. He, he loves, he loves wine. Australian wine. He yeah. really loves Australian wine. Yeah. Next up, we, we are we're getting through them, which is awesome. So cool. hopefully everyone does hear every drop that we have in front of us. But we have our fifth wine here. Okay, so this is uh, Ugo. So this is a total and absolute folly. Uh, this is Sangiovese Brunello clone, which I planted uh, there in 1998. So what are the earliest plantings of Brunello in Australia? Um, it is uh, picked in May, so you can tell how cold that is. Then it has 20% Merlot and 10% Cabernet Franc. So, so it's Super Tuscan. Yeah, it's my homage to Super Tuscan. Uh, we don't make this every year, but this is an incredible wine. Um, uh, it's, um, it's, I love this wine. It's incredible. This is 2018, incredible density, finesse, um, it has this really beautiful ability to show what I love about Sangiovese, which is that uh, bloodiness, mm -hmm. um, yeah. that sour cherry. Yeah, I was going to say a lot of character, a lot of personality, a lot of that sour, sourness, sour cherry, Huge raspberry, on the nose. cranberry, tart, mm. tartness. It feels like you, the moment he goes on a palate, it's going to be sour, but sour in a nice way, right? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like yeah. that mm. dried fruit, dried red fruit. I always think about this as um, being like in, I, I didn't have a nonna because I'm not Italian, but a nonna's kitchen, you know, where you have Parma ham and you've got um, the tomatoes you know, on the kitchen, tomatoes and, on the yeah, kitchen, yeah, yeah. and yeah. basil, a wild almost herbs, like herbs and, yeah, yeah. And it, for me, and it's a really quite a special one. Mm. And also the freedom that we have in Australia, right, to to do this kind of stuff, in which. You don't have to abide by any regulation, any DOCs or AOCs or no, not at whichever. All. So it's so that's, versatile. That's a, the key to us. I mean, I'm an experimenter and so is Marie. And to be able to play and make and imagine, I mean, that's really core to my self. And so, you know, at the end of the day, I make wines which are very much about what nourishes my soul. Um, so you know, to be ability to, to play, I think suits my personality you know that's always been the way i've been and making wine I, i'm playing mm. you make your 57 wines like you make your painting yeah yeah it, it and it's actually very interesting it's very much like that it's all coming out of me it's not i don't have a, i don't write anything down i don't make it up i don't look at a recipe it's all happening in the flow i always think about my wines as sort of like live performances good last but not least Oh, so good. I think that Nebbiolo is a 
incredible grape. It's uh, it's for me. It's I think, in my opinion, anyway, or at least for me. Uh, I think that in every Pinot Noir maker, there's always a Nebbiolo maker trying to get out because I think as difficult as Pinot is to make, Nebbiolo is 10 times more difficult because it's easy to make Nebbiolo look like Shiraz or like something else because you use those techniques. But Nebbiolo is so fine to get that sort of earthy, um, high tannin but supple, um, savoury, but has some sweet core of fruit, but not anything you can put your finger on, that's Barolo. You know, that is good Nebbiolo. That is hard to get when you use sort of fairly um, Australian general techniques of making wine. So I have done this totally differently. So more old school uh, Piedmonte. So there's up to 100 days on skin in large wood and fermenters, uh, two years in body. So two years in two and a half thousand liter body. And then, like you were saying before, Angus, I have the ability to wait. I wait another two years before you get to see this wine. Because no one in their right mind will be drinking Barolo uh, that is one year old or Not two a traditionalist, no, no, yeah, exactly. Unless when, he's a modern producer. But... Yeah, but I mean, modern producers making Lange, yeah, whatever. Mm, exactly. But if you're looking at the top producers... Um, I think you want to produce that savoury, textural wine. I love your thoughts. But this is fruit from the Malakoff vineyard because we couldn't possibly grow. Um, we're too cold for Nebbiolo in Geelong. Um, there's quite a few uh, examples from the uh, Malakoff vineyard. With clay. They clay, clay. Yeah, they've clay, got yeah. quite a lot of clay through certain sections. What's your thoughts, Angus? Uh, mate, mm. I'm just like you. Just listen to the master. Do his thing. Yeah. Uh, um, no, I think is I think is really delicious. I mean, um, the tannins. I mean, again, with the age, the tannins are there. They they stick to the gums, but in a very nice way, very fine way. That you see the development. You see that there is age in these wines. It's not like if you have a Barolo with one or two years, as you say, uh, after being bottled, that is like really really aggressive. This is now calling for food. And yeah, I think protein, red meat would like just definitely, yeah, some, or, or, you know, like a duck or something gamey, something like uh, with strong flavor and like a dried berry sauce or something like this. But it's it's really, uh, it's really supple at the moment. Uh, it's elegant. It's very long. It's, yeah, it's just drinking, linking like a Piemonte here. Yeah. Drinking like an Australian Nebbiolo done well, I hope. <laughs> yeah. And you're, you know, for example, these are under Coravin, so you're taking these back to the Celador, so you do uh, Celador tastings. Is it just on weekends? Uh, no, we, we're, we're kind of like the 7-Eleven of wineries because we work every day. Um, when you come and drop into our place, you'll, you know, you'll see us working and uh, we, we don't do it like a, a bar because I'm not a barman, I'm a winemaker. So you come in, you sit at the table, which we all have lunch at normally. So you come and sit at the table, we show you some wine. So, yeah, so we 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 have two cellar doors. Uh, so the one at the sort of mothership at Lethbridge, that's that's where we make the wine. Um, and then we have a similar that one um, down at the Bellarine where uh, we have one of our vineyards because we've got a number of vineyards across Geelong. Um what, that's why, hence we end up with all these single site Pinot and Chardonnays. Yeah. I think there's 07, like coming back to it now. I think um, if you if you put this on a blind tasting, you'd be struggle. I would. <laughs> you struggle a lot. Yeah. Yeah. You well, which very, is what very, happened very, in um, London last year when I showed this to a whole bunch of uh, master you, master you, wines. They were pretty like shocked. Yeah, uh, you, you are very much in in an European wine region in Burgundy, for instance. Yeah. It's very compliment. difficult. What to... I love about it is that you that 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 sort of feel and sensibility can be created at home. You know, we have great terroir here. We have great winemakers here. It can be done. You know, so I think that you know, um, and, and I'm happy to see it in Australia where you see such a great wine lists where you are you know having great Australian wines being supported. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. 
Well, all the details and how to follow you, one click away in the show notes. Uh, Ray, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for bringing in a great selection of Lethbridge. And, um, yeah, if you're ever in the Geelong region or if you're in Melbourne, don't go down maybe this time down the Mornington Way, head down the uh, M1 and go and visit some of our great Geelong producers. Thanks for your time. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time.